Hello, this is Jimbo from the YouTube channel Jimbo South Dakota, and this is the Hog House Chronicles podcast. And today I got a friend of mine sitting next to me, Don Paulson, and uh, I've gotten to know him a little bit better lately. We've done some work down at the church, helping uh, put up a gazebo with some friends out there and your brother, mm -hmm. and also uh, moving some pictures just the other day. And he agreed to uh, come and talk about his military experience the other day, and here we are. This is only a few days later. So... Don, yeah, just kind of curious because there's a lot I don't know about you, and that's that's why we do these is for for me because I get to listen to them all. Sure, but then also mm -hmm. to preserve for your family, friends, and and uh, anybody else that wants to take a look at the video. So, uh, did you grow up in this area then? I did. I I was uh, I born I was born in Sioux Falls, and then I grew up on a farm about seven miles from here, and went to country grade school. Uh, one room, one teacher. She did all eight grades, and it was a good experience. Walk to school, um, both ways, both uphill, ways, <laughs> in the snow, barefoot. Yeah. I've done that before, <laughs> not barefoot, but <laughs> but yeah, it, it, it's all it's all good experience, and uh, I, I guess I can't complain about my life. It's been good, and I can't change it anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> exactly, yeah. So that's what. Uh, Hopefully at the time helps you make uh, good choices at the time, but we all stray every here every once in a while. There, right. So, right. So, uh, what age were you when uh, you did you get interested in the military, or were you drafted in, or how did that all happen? I really wasn't interested in the service. I mean, it was about the time Vietnam was going on. Okay. And uh, a classmate of mine had gone in the service, and he was on a aircraft carrier, the USS Ticonderoga. And he came home on leave, and I don't know why, but it just sounded glamorous mm -hmm. to me. And, and that's what got me started thinking about it. And then, and then I signed up and joined. I went down to Kansas City to actually get sworn in. And we were there overnight, and then from there, we flew out to San Diego. Mm-hmm. We did have our choice whether San Diego or Great Lakes. Well, I had enough snow, so I thought, well, great, or San Diego would be great. <laughs> right, so it was the Navy that right. you went into. Right. Yeah, right. I see you've got the Navy Seabees hat on there, and we'll get into that a little bit later. Okay. Um, so uh, where did you do your basic training, and how long was it? I did my basic training in, in San Diego, and it was uh, eight, eight weeks. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to standard, they making you do follow orders and all of that. So it, it, it's understandable what, what you, they make you do. Mm -hmm. Do you think they modified it much because the war was going on, you know, like to shorten it up or anything, or special training while we were there because Vietnam was going on? I really don't think so. It was about the same length as it's been, you know, and we did um, had the rifle range and all of that, so we had all that experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, he brought uh, a lot of pictures and things that we went through ahead of time. I've got some notes here about it, um, so we'll be putting pictures up there uh, as we're talking. Had a lot of lot of interesting uh, photos in there, so I'm uh, I'm anxious to do the editing on this and put the whole thing together. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to seeing it when it's finished. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, about what year was it then that you went into basic? Uh, you might have said that, and then where did you move on from there for? training it was third of march that i actually got down to san diego and that's when my navy career started yeah what year yeah. was that that was 1968 68 okay yeah. so right. and i did four years to the day mm -hmm. just because at the end of that time i'd met my future wife and she was in rhode island and that's mm -hmm. where i finished up my career and so we got married out there Okay. And then I drug her back here to South Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> and then you continued from there, but we'll get to that a ways down the road after yeah. we get through your active duty time. So you, we spoke of some training that you did. You said there's like A and B and C. Go ahead and explain how that works. Okay. Well, after A school, everybody goes through A school to whatever field that they chose to be in. And then with B and C school... That's just more advanced training, 
in the same fields that they originally started in. Mm -hmm. So as they they wanted to stay in the service, but then they could go to B school or C school, but they had to obligate themselves to more time in the service. Okay, I was going to ask, because so your A school basically lasts your first four years, right? period. Yeah. Mm. So if you stay in and you can broaden your horizons and change, or if they have critical career fields that they need more help, you can transfer into those? Right, right. Okay. Yeah. How long was your A school, and what was it? Uh, I think that was... Uh, I'd have to stop and think. It, it was at least two months, if not a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. You know, and of course, at the end, then you had to do the final testing and all of that. And then, uh, as soon as we were finished with A school, we all rush outside and see where our names are to see where our next assignment is. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it was it was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> now, since you went through the. All of you were in the same A school class. Were you able to trade if you were had somebody that that you wanted that would be willing to trade with you? Or when you saw those orders after your A school, that's where you were going. Yeah, it was that was pretty much set in concrete. Okay. Yeah. So. Yeah, because that's us talking a little bit earlier. Um, in uh, when I got out of my tech school, which is a A school basically. There was a couple of guys that had swapped out, and they they had that okayed. You know, mm -hmm. there's an official process, but uh, they did let some of that happen because at least they were getting a body, a trained body where they needed. Sure, yeah. So they yeah. had a little bit of that. Yeah, it was it was interesting. You know, as soon as we come out, we're looking at okay, where's our next assignment, and then we're okay, where's that at? Where's that at? You know, we had no idea. Mm -hmm. So it was it was fun, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, what was your A-school training in? I was in uh, carpentry building, and um, we had to build a small, you know, a group of us, we had to build a small small house. That's mm -hmm. what it amounted to, just frame it up. Mm -hmm. So then we had got graded over that, and that was it. Okay. So when you're done with your A-school, that's when you were considered a CB? Right, right. Okay. Yeah, because I I had heard that term through the years, and I was Air Force the whole time through, so I didn't know what Navy CBs were. Right. Uh, can you go ahead and explain what that was? Okay, the, the CBs, for the most part, everybody just thinks of them as a picture of a bee with legs, with a hammer, saw, a wrench, whatever you know. But the CB actually stands for Construction Battalion, so. Uh, as a groups, battalions, there was Naval Mobile Construction Battalion, one, two, three, whatever, whatever it was. And I happened to be in a detachment from one of those battalions. And I was in part of a uh, NMCB3, but I was in my detachment. We were 301, CBMU 301, Construction Battalion Mobile Unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I had no idea that it, it came from an acronym, letter C, letter B, construction right. to battalion, but it's spelled out S E A B E E. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, so I learned uh, <laughs> I learned something. I learned a lot when I'm doing these and the before and after as well. Oh, good. So yeah, so you're a, you're a CB. So you got done with that training, and uh, you found out where you were going. What did your chart say on where you were going? It said Midway Island. Midway. And I had no clue. You know, I'm if I'd have thought about history, I guess I would have knew that but you know if you're in the military now what's gonna where am i gonna mm -hmm. go what's gonna happen and so but i found out pretty quick where midway was mm -hmm. and uh so you you made your way there so you were were you in a mix with a bunch of brand new guys going there or how did you get transported there and who were you flying with if you no, remember? there wasn't there really wasn't a bunch of us um And I guess I can't recall just how many there were of us, but uh, we just we flew in on a regular plane, regular flight, mm -hmm. and we just dispersed out of there when we landed on Midway. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, so what job did you do while you were at Midway? I was assigned to special services, which is... A department that takes care of the recreation for the people at the, on the island, 
Uh, we'd manage like the bowling alley, movie theater, golf course. We had a golf course, and we had a bike shop, a woodworking shop, and a ceramic shop. And we even had uh, a place where they could rent boats. But I don't think too many people wanted to go out <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you have sharks out there. So. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> yeah. So. Mm. So this was a this was a full up military base that you oh yes yes went to obviously with Bowling Alley and such so right yeah. after the big war that was all uh, just still occupied oh yeah 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 right and that was that was good duty we not only did our day job but then in the evenings we rotated between managing and running the bowling alley or the movie theater or woodworking shop whatever it was and the great part about all that was. It was extra pay. You know, we got our military pay, and then when we spent all these other hours doing this extra work, well, it was extra money. So it mm -hmm. was all, all good. So most of your training was construction, but then that also included this, the services and managing the facilities that you just mentioned then. Right. Were you, were you trained to manage and do all the desk work during your A school as well, or is that just something you had to learn once you No, were that was just, okay, they put you there, you learn it, and that's what you do. Mm -hmm. so, so, yeah, I, I spent more time behind the desk than I did actually doing anything construction. Mm -hmm. so, and it was okay. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, so. that's not terrible. you got to no. have uh, <laughs> people that do all the admin stuff in order to make everything work. Right, right. So. Not everything's a... Uh, war movie glory job no <laughs> you know of, <laughs> and uh did you meet anybody interesting when you were at midway or have anything any uh anything's happened anything oh, there, there some, that you want to pass there on? some characters you know you always run into certain people that are no more outstanding than others just because of whatever uh had one experience i was never a golfer but you know, not much to do on an island like that. So uh, I did kind of pick up doing that for the time that I was there. And uh, uh, me and another guy, his name was Harry St. John, and he was one of those characters. And we were up on top of a hill and going to tee off down to the bottom. I think it was a par three hole. And so I got to put the ball on the tee, hit it, and we stood there and watched it, and it went... Flew so nice down over the hill, hit the green, rolled, and went right in the hole. And we both stood there, and <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> hole in one. Yeah. I presume that's the only hole in one you've that's had in your the life. the only one I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> and only seen by two of you. Yeah, yeah. And I wished I had got him to write down what happened, just <laughs> so I'd have proof. <laughs> then I, I think people believe you. <laughs> no reason to lie about that. <laughs> then I had another experience on Midway. They have what we call the goonie birds, but they're albatross is what they are. And they're about the size of a goose. And they're all over the island. There's no predators there, so they go wherever they want and make their nests wherever they want. But this one time, and I was playing golf, and I hit the ball, and it was just a straight drive. It probably wasn't more than two feet off the ground, and it hit a goonie bird right in the head and killed it dead right now. Oh, my word. <laughs> You know, and, and you aren't supposed to <laughs> kill goonie birds. I mean, they're... <laughs> so now what do I do? <laughs> well, I just found something we have in common because I am not a golfer, <laughs> and my brother's built a house over at Lake Park over there on, on Silver Lake. And another friend of mine, Rex, and I went over there and his wife for the weekend, and my wife and my brother had gotten into golf just a little bit, which really surprised me. But we were going <laughs> to shoot a round of golf, the first, like, serious round of golf I've ever done. So we got bucket of balls. <laughs> we're driving. They're trying to teach me how to hit and all that stuff. And we're about a third of the way through the course, and I slice it so bad. <laughs> and I hit a robin right in the head. It's either robin or blackbird. I think it was robin. And the thing spun and down, and it was only like three feet off the ground because the ball was skipping off the ground. I'm and sure. I was watching it, and I'm like, get out of the way. Get out of the way. <laughs> nope. And uh, But it, luckily it didn't kill it. It stunned it. And uh, by the time we walked over there, it flopped around a few times and then pff, up, up and gone. So 
we have both hit birds in the head with <laughs> golf balls. Who would have thought? Yeah, when you think, what, what are the chances of doing that and hitting them right in the head? Exactly. <laughs> now, one thing, too, about these goonie birds, they're, they can land on water beautifully. But when they come to land on land, you know, they're, they're used to gliding when they hit the surface. Well, when they hit the ground, they don't glide. They just they fall and roll and roll till they stop rolling, and then... Then they're good after that. But <laughs> <laughs> so. Oh, man. So did, uh, did they do any USO stuff on Midway even, you know, because they would go around to some of the war zones and things and, and perform, but would they come to like Midway and perform some as well? When I was there, we did have one USO show, and it was, it was Bob Hope show. And so I seen him, I seen... Uh, uh, Raquel Welch, and there was a couple other women. That, Anne Margaret, I think you mentioned. Or maybe it was Anne Margaret, too, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it had its perks, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, uh, then also, when I was there, it was when uh, Nixon and, or was Khrushchev? I don't Khrushchev, remember. maybe. Yeah, they were there for a, what do you call it, summit meeting or whatever it may be, you know, and we... If we were going to be outside, we all had to wear our dress white uniforms. Mm. You know, so I don't think too many were too interested in going out. But right. yeah, there were a few. Well, a lot of times when the president's coming around, they'll make people, you know, either vacate the base or, you know, not be outside. Yeah, or you got to put your Sunday best on. I guess you call yep, it. Yeah, if you're going to be out there. Yep. Um, yeah, that's pretty cool. So, anything else come to mind for your time on? On Midway, and and how long were you there? I was there for a year. Um, it was a great duty, you know. It, uh, I did run the movie theater and managed the bowling alley, and uh, and when the first Clint Eastwood movies came out, the Spaghetti Westerns. Oh yeah, you know I, that was good. <laughs> oh yeah, and I got to show those movies. So. Did did they uh, did they take off in popularity right away, or did that after they saw, saw did they get to see them more than once, or was it just no, one it showing just, it? A, it was maybe two three days, and then that was it. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, because so. uh, it seems like uh, those in some areas they didn't take off right away, but then as time went on, they're you know they're like a cult western right, and stuff yeah. now. Yeah, I've, people love. I still enjoy them. Oh, yeah, I watch them over and over yeah, again. Yeah, yeah especially yeah. here in the hog house. We've got the screen over here and TV over there and DVD player, <laughs> and I'll be out here by myself, say I'm setting up this stuff or what have you. And, sure. Oh, yeah, John Wayne and Clint Eastwood. <laughs> they yeah. are they're on here, out here quite often. Let's see, I had a question there. I lost it when I started thinking about old Westerns. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. And so, when uh, was it just a normal rota- rotation when you left Midway, uh, uh, and where did you go from Midway? And if you think of something more about Midway, feel free to jump okay, back to yeah, it. We're yeah. we're not like leaving a subject never to be returned again. Yeah, okay. Um, so what what caused the move, or how did that all come about, and where did you go? Well, one other thing about Midway, we'd have ships come in with food and things for the exchange and all of that. So when they'd come in, we'd have working parties, whether, you know, it'd be 24 hours around the clock. So we'd all get involved with that. And it was interesting because you could see, okay, here's this is coming in. I think I want to buy that when it gets in the exchange or, you know, that type of thing. And so that, that was good. That was good. Mm-hmm. So you'd and, work a 24-hour shift just well, doing it was, it was probably Well, it was probably six hours at a time. Yeah. 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 And that was so, just bringing goods and service to, to support the services. Right. We'd have to be down in the pit in the ship, and right. they'd have cranes that would lift pallets of all that up. How often to, would that happen? Oh, it could happen a couple times a week. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Year-round, a couple times a week? Yeah, yeah. Oh, my <laughs> word. How, do you have any idea how many people were on the base? I, I couldn't even guess. No. Had to be a lot with yeah. that much supply happening. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I couldn't even try to guess. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was a small island, but there were people, a lot of mm-hmm. people there. You know, so. Okay. So then from there, 
you went to where and, and how? Okay, from there, I took 30 days leave, and then I came back to California to Port Wainemi. That's where they do uh, all our combat training and preparing to go overseas. So I went there for about a month, I would think, and then uh, from there, then we got sent to Vietnam. Mm, Vietnam. Yeah. What did you think about that at the time? I mean, what what went through your head when that well, piece of paper came to your hand? Yeah, well, there's not much you can do about it. I mean, well, I got to go, but whatever happens, happens. Mm -hmm. um, we flew in to Da Nang, and then we spent the night in Da Nang till they're trying to decide where to, what part of the country to ship us to. And I can remember I didn't get much sleep that night because off in the distance you could hear rockets going off or mortar and you'd see the light shine up in the sky and so it wasn't a very sleepful night right and then after that then we got sent to our assigned places my first place was uh Quang Tri north of Da Nang and so there we were getting out well that was pretty much up by the DMZ at the at that time mm -hmm. yeah and you uh you brought a map and i'm gonna try to get a a scan of that and and, mm -hmm. and put that up uh, so people can see where you're talking about and most of my time there was uh doing night bunker perimeter watches you know there's three people to a bunker and one up and two down you know two guys sleeping so it was kind of bothersome i mean down way down below us there was a river and these people, Vietnamese, would be out walking in the river fishing at night, you know. And so you're sometimes you wonder, okay, who are they? Yeah, so. <laughs> doesn't seem like a normal thing, <laughs> no. but you know, what do we know right. about their culture? You know, right? Yeah. So that was uh, like within your first week, you were assigned to that post after oh, yeah. that first night, right away. Yeah, mm -hmm. went there, and then I was there for. The, doing the bunker security for quite a while. And then after that, well, then you kind of get placed out into the, to the working environment. Mm -hmm. So somebody else has to fill in. Oh, okay. So you would, uh, you would shift on and off the bunker duty? And how often would that happen? As far as you three guys there, are you you're doing that duty for a few days or a week, and then you go do your other job? Or what was that shifting like? No, it was, it was every every night, for however long we were going to be doing that. Oh, okay. You know, it wasn't like a week here and then maybe a week there, but it was, you know, if it was six weeks or whatever it was, you know, that's what we did all the time. We during the day we'd be back at the base sleeping or doing restful things and right. Um, so that was just kind of a constant being out there every night. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd come out and drive us, drop it off, and. You know, there's bunkers weren't all that far apart, so there's quite a few people standing bunker watches. Right. So you were doing full perimeter around around a base then. Right. Yeah. So there was many of you, probably what 50 yards apart or so, all these bunkers. Yeah. yeah something like that. You know, For and then the during the day, everybody comes in and nobody's out on the perimeter, so there must have been some other security during the day. I mean. Mm -hmm. They probably aren't going to attack a base during the day, I would guess. Right. How did the uh, how did the resupplying work on that base? I mean, it was all airplanes coming in. Oh yeah. Uh, and and yeah. were you involved with the unloading of the cargo like services? It was similar to Midway, or was this no. totally different duty? Yeah, it was, it was totally different. I mean, that was that was a completely different area. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I don't even know anything about that. Right. Yep. So uh, you're you're there, helping take care of the base and guard the base for all the troops that were going out during the day and or night or coming back or they'd be gone for two three weeks and come back for some rest and then you're responsible for getting them that rest. Is that kind of what? I'm well, I, I don't know. We were just you know we were there for maintenance type of work, I guess, you know, keep anything that broke down, we'd be there to repair it and fix it. That's pretty much what what, uh, what we did, you know, because it wasn't just the CBs that were on this base. It was Army, right? 
you know, everybody was there. And if somebody had to, something break down, why, you know, whoever was qualified, be the CBs or Army or whoever it was, it would go with mm-hmm. and repair. Yeah, because when you watch the movies, you know, you don't know how much, how real it, the reality of it. But uh, you, you tend to see where troops are out in the jungle for quite a while, and then every once in a while they're, they're on a base right. and they're relaxing a little bit more, uh, you know, letting their, you know, a lot of times their, their feet would get blistered up and oh, yeah. trench foot, so they, they have to have a place to go to, to heal up and stuff, and that's kind of what I'm envisioning that base was, uh, troops yeah. going in and out. Because uh, like you said, it wasn't just Navy guys there, obviously. No, no. But, but I, didn't, I didn't see too much of that mm-hmm. where I was part of the base that I was at. Okay. All right. How long were you at that base then? I think you said you moved to a different one. Right. We were there uh, probably five, six months. And then during that time where we were um, preparing for the move, like I was working out on the stacking up runway matting and strapping it together, getting ready to be moving all of that. And... Um, then when it came time to actually move, you know, we had, they call them six buys or like a five ton truck or whatever it may be. And, uh, we'd all caravan down to Chulai. What is runway matting? It's, it's steel plates. Like they're three feet by 10 feet long and they lock together. So... You know, if somebody wants to be able to land a plane someplace, why they have to lay all this out and lock it together and get it all secure so it's a hard surface to land on. Wow. That had to be a tremendous job. <laughs> oh, yeah. And it, it was heavy. <laughs> oh, my word. So then if they, if they needed to make a landing strip uh, quickly, they would just go out and level some areas right. using oh. heavy equipment and then just start laying all those plates down. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> How big a, pe- a plane's usually landed on those, do you remember? I think they could land any size plane. Any there. size plane. Yeah, yeah. Wow. <laughs> so that runway matting, I mean, you would have just acres of those oh, yeah, piled up. Yeah, yeah. To lay out. Uh, and that's not something they would just do sporadically. So once <laughs> once they laid that out, it was... Yeah, you'd want to use it for a while. <laughs> stayed quite a while, didn't it? <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. Hadn't heard of that before. I think I saw a picture of that. You were right. you were talking about it mm-hmm. there, but um, runway matting—they make it sound so easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it was a, it was a job. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, I don't remember the term you used, but what what did you call it when you were going from your first base to your second base in Vietnam? Caravanning. Caravanning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and. When I was riding, I was on, we had a five-ton truck just packed full of sea bags, and there were a bunch of us sitting on top of the sea bags, and we'd be going down the highway, and, you know, there, you go through small villages and whatever, and uh, there'd be guys up there digging in their sea rations and be throwing stuff out, you know, and the little kids would be running back and forth between the trucks, you know, it's... I. It just makes me shudder to think of that anymore. I mean, it was dangerous. But. <laughs> like I said, they think they think throwing candy in parades is dangerous. Right. Here, you know, <laughs> got to hand them the candy. Yeah, yeah. Know? But but it was you got to see some country, so that that mm-hmm. part I enjoyed that. But you know, dry's kind of looking over your shoulder. Okay. <laughs> yeah, and the sea bags was just was that just your luggage or, or just part of some regular gear? Oh, it was everybody's luggage. So you just sat up there and, and traveled. How many? Uh, do you know how many miles or how many days I, you were on that thing? Oh, well, it, it was a, it was a, in a day we did that. One day, yeah, okay. Yeah. So, and what was the name of the the second base you were headed to? Chulai Caravan. Chulai. C H U L A I. Was but, it the exact same duty you were doing there, or, or what did that turn out like? No, it was it was different. I got involved with uh, laying <laughs> block. The concrete block, you know, and I'd never done that before in my entire life, and it was a really good learning experience. We were building housing for the South Vietnamese people. Oh, okay. So it was it was quite interesting, and 
I enjoyed doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, at least I felt like I was doing something in my rating. <laughs> so, you, so you were at a base, but you were going off base to build this housing. No, it was or, it was, was right it on base. Yeah, it was on base. It was for the South Vietnamese. Right. Yeah. I mean, there, this was right on a. There was a. It wasn't really a lake, but an inlet, and that's where this was built. Right on by that inlet, and uh, yeah. yeah. Before the base was there, I'm not sure if you know, but was there like a village there before, or did it just start out as a military base, but then they were also allowing housing for the locals on that? I, I really don't know the answer to that one. Mm -hmm. I don't. But, okay. But, but we never had to go off base to go go to that work site. Right. Okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way it was when I was in Iraq, you know, each, I went to the same place all three times, but we never went outside of the wire. Oh, sure. Yep. Uh, there. Yep. But uh, were you, uh, on the first base and or the second base, were you getting mortared at all while you're at either base? At the second base, we took some incoming, and this would happen early in the morning before people were actually out and about. You know, guys were still taking showers and getting up. So this... this Rocket hit about where our motor pool area was, and got a picture there where it shows the big hole that the rocket left, and then shrapnel went through the one of the buildings. And fortunately, nobody was out there, so so that was good. Yeah, because you were saying like if it would have been a half hour later, right? Then yep. some people probably would have lost their yeah, lives because everybody goes to the motor pool to get their vehicles for the day, and mm -hmm. right. Yeah. So, so was that a very common occurrence with mortars or rockets coming into the base you were at? That's the only time that I knew of while I was there. That's good. Yeah, yeah. That's good. So. We don't need any glory stories, <laughs> no. you know, with that stuff. And, no. you know, sometimes people like to hear that, but I also, I also like to hear that not every base and not everybody's service is filled with that. Right, You know, and right. the gore and stuff. Yeah. Um, but still got the experiences over there. So. Oh, yeah. So I would, I would... Uh, like I said, with mine, I would kind of say your experience with Vietnam and my experience with uh, Iraq were fairly similar. Mm -hmm. um, we would have mortars coming in, but the base was so big. Um, it's one that uh, Saddam had built. Oh, sure. Um, so we call it the golden BB. Oh. You know, if you got hit by one of those, <laughs> you you just had a bad day. But uh, there was one that landed a couple hundred yards from the shop I was in. Oh, uh, and it hit this small little bunker, and it just had a little black burn spot, you know. But you wouldn't want to bend there when it right, went up, because yeah, they say yeah. the. And my uncle, uh, Uncle Glenn, that uh, we did a podcast with, uh, he said the same thing. We were told that when when those smaller mortars hit, the blast goes up at a forty five degree angle. Mm -hmm. So you want to hit the ground. You don't want to be running. Right. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so so that was uh, that was about it for me there. But we had, uh, but they also had the. Uh, I never thought of this before, but they had at our base um, defenses called as two different names. C Ram was what I remember right now, but they were these these huge like Gatlin guns with the big radar dome up top, oh, okay. and they were actually they were built for being mounted on ships. You know, I don't know if on the on the bow and the stern or what, mm -hmm. but they will uh, there'll be an alarm go off when something's coming in. But it calculates the trajectory. So being on a ship, if it was going to miss the ship, it wouldn't even fire. But if it, the trajectory, trajectory was to where it was going to hit the ship, and then it would just, I mean, it just sound like a chainsaw <laughs> going, you know, and there was tracer bullets mm -hmm. and stuff too. So they actually had those stationed around Balad, and they worked the same way that the Navy used them oh, okay. on ships. Wow. And they would mm -hmm. test them every once in a while too, but they wouldn't necessarily tell you. <laughs> that they're testing them, but uh, I don't know. Maybe if I, I might have some video. I might, I might be able to put a little video on here. I'll, I'll take a look when we're editing. Okay. But that's a, a Navy thing that was on that base. I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, mm -hmm. how they ad adapted that.
what are some other experiences you remember on uh, on that second base? The USO came there as well. Did you see yeah, Bob they, Hope they at did, both yeah. places? Yeah, yeah. But seeing Bob Hope there again, and mm -hmm. uh, of course he's he makes it around to a lot of places, and so yeah, seeing him and uh, some of the women. I guess I can't remember all of them, but sure. Yeah, but mm -hmm. we'd sit, be sitting on the side of a hill, you know, and then the, their stage would be down at the bottom. So, um, so were you like way away? You saw oh, them yeah. when they were about that yeah. big. <laughs> so it's pretty yeah. large base you were oh, out yeah. there too. Yeah. yeah. Trying to look at some of the notes here. I knew I'd. Uh... Oh, I'm going to put some pictures of uh, the military script. I had remembered hearing that term years ago, and I didn't really know what it was. But I'll put pictures up of that as well too. But you've got some in your scrapbook. Explain right. what the scripts it's, were. It's all. It's military money instead of having like the dollar bill and all that that we use now. It's paper money, and here's a here might be a twenty five cent script or ten cent script, five cent script or whatever you know. And it's they're different colors, so you but they had the numbers on them, so it was all used to when we bought bought stuff overseas. Mm -hmm. And the, periodically they would change it just because there'd be too much of it on the market and. You know, if it got into the wrong hands, why? Right. Yeah. So is that something where would they would they pay you in scripts, or did you like have American dollars and then you would exchange to get a certain amount of scripts, or was did you deal with like American cash at no. all over there? No, nothing. In fact, if you ever saw a real one dollar bill or five dollar bill, it's like, well, that's pretty strange. <laughs> I mean, because right. you haven't haven't seen it for so long. Oh, yeah. Because you had a dollar in one of your photo albums. You said uh, a Vietnam, Vietnamese lady gave that to you? Yeah. Or? You know, I I suppose some service person gave that to her someplace along the line, and, of course, she couldn't spend it over there. It meant so, nothing no. <laughs> over there at all. So she just gave it, yeah, gave it yeah. to you. So, I mean, so that was interesting. You know, I never expected to get something like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's why I had to put it in my scrapbook, just because. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And you had a lot of cool pictures uh, over there that we're going to be uh, scanning in and things. Okay. So, uh, which, uh, which base, if you can enjoy a base in Vietnam, which base did you enjoy working at more and why? Well, it was the second base, Chulai, because I was more active in doing projects in my rating mm -hmm. and I also was in a department called general services which was taking local Vietnamese people around and we'd try to look for rats and mice and all that kind of stuff you know I mean it's <laughs> you wouldn't think of something like that and to do that but and that was on base yeah it was on so base. you're doing maintenance on base trying to Trying to keep it as as nice for the troops as possible, right? And we'd have Vietnamese people, you know, that had have been properly scanned and all that. They would come on base in the mornings and report in to where they're supposed to be, and then they'd get dispersed from there. Right. And if I remember the term right, uh, when we had that over at our base, uh, they were called third party nationals, maybe. I don't remember if that's the exact term. I know that's a term. Uh, I think we maybe use that in our exercises as well when we were planning what personnel could do what, you know, based on the, the manning document on mm -hmm. who you would have there if you were in war. Sure. Because, like, if the if the Air Guard up here, you know, gets deployed for war, it's not everybody on the base that goes. You know, it's only right. the people that are on the manning documents to, right. you know, to go to combat. Um, we, were, they just, we just called them... Vietnamese nationals, mm -hmm. you know, so they've already been screened, so we were pretty well mm -hmm. satisfied that we right. could take them wherever and do do their job, whatever it yeah. may be. And ours were escorted around base, too. You know, mm -hmm. they had uh, generally an armed escort, and they were, you know, cleaning the latrines and trying to keep things good for, for the troops yeah. is what they were used yeah. as. We never were armed, so I don't know if that was good <laughs> or bad. Yeah. <laughs> Your second base was that was that much larger than the first one you were at? I think it was. You know, I, 
there was there were more facilities there, and uh, so I, yeah, and it was larger. Mm -hmm. While you were at either base or any time you were over there, did you did you get a point where your mind was like, okay, I'm ready to go home. I've had enough of this. Or what were some of your feelings and you know, as you were over there, what was going on in your brain? I guess I, <laughs> that's where I was, and I just had to do what I was supposed to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, and then in the monsoon seasons, well, then your mind was focused on <laughs> all the rain and mud and all of that, you know, and it, it was a mess. But, uh, but yeah, I, of course, in the back of your mind, you're always thinking, boy, the sooner I get out of here, the better, but but you're, it's just a wait, waiting game because you've done your time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, my experience is uh, whether you're on a two-week trip here in the States on a, on a temporary duty TDY or you're deployed, you know, your brain just when, – when I went, we knew how long we were going to be gone. Right. You know, uh, so once you get about 80% into that, <laughs> you know, then your brain switched and you just start <laughs> thinking about getting home and stuff. Right. That's wow. the selfish part of us, I guess. <laughs> Not on your part, but on mine. Well, I've had that feeling too, you know, like when, when I got off of active duty, I did join the reserves a few years later mm -hmm. and then we'd do two weeks a year and we'd do one weekend a month. So when we did those two weeks act dutra, they called it, uh, okay, we got there and okay, we can start doing our countdown right away, <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. how much time we had left. Right. So when you were over there, uh, so the second base you were at at Vietnam, that's where you left from when you came home? Right. When you got out. So you finished your four years at that at that base? Just my, and, my Vietnam service. Yeah. After that, I came back to uh, Davisville, Rhode Island, the 21st Naval Construction Regiment. Okay. And I finished out, what did I have, about a year and a half left. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. that was the end of my duty there, and then that's where I met my wife. Mm hmm Okay. Yeah. And uh, so toward the end or during any of your naval career, was there talk of, like, the reserves? Did most of them, you know, get out and just say, I've had enough? Or, or was there much talk of the reserves? And I'm saying this because a lot of people don't even know, like, the Guard exists in certain areas. And then uh, the, my active duty counterparts, a lot of them, as we got to know them more, when I had a higher position and got able to speak with them and uh, go to meetings with them and stuff, they didn't really know much about the guard. They knew maybe more about the reserves because in the air force, the reserves are tied more to an active duty unit and active mm -hmm. duty base. The guard can be anywhere. Like we're, we're alongside a municipal airport, a mm -hmm. regional airport yeah. here. Um, so was there much talk of service after Vietnam? I never, Never heard anybody talk about joining the reserves or anything, and I—that was the farthest thing from my mind at the time. <laughs> and I was, you know, I was out. <laughs> That's for, what I was wondering. <laughs> I was out for, I don't know, three, four years, and then you know I started hearing about this, and and I just thought, well, you know, that might not be too bad uh, if I can stay with it long enough and maybe retire. You know, you get you gather points as you're. Mm -hmm. doing reserve time and so that well I'll try it and see how it goes and so I stuck it out for 16 years and worked out good sure so you got out of the navy and you you came right back home here then yes mm -hmm. and uh well I didn't come back right home I I got married in Rhode Island so it was I got out in March and I got married in June 3rd and then short time after that then we came back to South Dakota. Uh huh. So, what were you doing for work when you came back here? I worked with my brother-in-law for a while. He was in construction, so I did that, and then I was applying for work different places, and then I finally got a job in Sioux Falls at uh, CCL Label. So I worked there for twenty-two years. Okay. And so, how did you learn about the reserve? Here in, you know, it seems kind of weird. We're right in the middle of the country in the Northern Plains. We got a Naval Reserve. Well, How did you find out about that then? Yeah. I had a friend of mine that was, he was in the Air Guard. And 
of course, that was his big thing because he was always talking about it, you know. So I got to looking around and uh, seeing they had a Naval Reserve in Sioux Falls that uh, isn't up near where the Elks Club used to be. Right. Yeah. So, so that's how I got involved. It wasn't all that long ago they, they tore that down. Is it within five years ago or so? I think so, yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. but that was, that was good duty. And if you couldn't make it for the weekend, you could come in during the week, which was a lot quieter time. And right, oh, it was it was good. I enjoyed it. So did you? So you didn't do any B B training or C training because you did your just four years. So you had your A training, right? And so then you just stayed with that same career field throughout your last sixteen years. Then right, yeah. If if, if I was going to advance any more training, I think I'd have to activate. Be activated. And, oh, you would. Okay, yeah, so yeah. they didn't have any in the reserves. There was no changing jobs. You no, were what no. you were. Right. Yep. Okay. When you did your weekend a month, what did you call that training? We just called it naval reserve. Yeah. Just reserve training. Yeah. Yeah. What would you do on a on a weekend with that while you're in Sioux Falls? Well, it was pretty boring, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, you know, if somebody they. Would, assign somebody to give a lecture or, or talk or something else. So mm -hmm. they'd, they'd have that. And uh, other times, our commanding officer of the Seabees, he was a civil engineer out at Pier. So at, on different weekends, he'd say, well, let's go out to Pier for the weekend. Mm -hmm. you know. And So we'd go out there, and they'd have jobs to do around the dam and those places like that. So it was, it was different. Right. Well, and I'm sure some of it was getting ready for your two week, you know, your two weeks a, week, a year. Did they always do that in the summertime or would you, would they do your two weeks like sporadically throughout the year? It was pretty much always during the summer months. Yeah. Do you have a lot of young, young folks? So you're trying to work around their college schedule as well? Yeah, there, there was a few of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So your weekends, you know, I'm sure some of them were getting ready for that two week, uh, would you go to San Diego a lot or it where, would, where did you go for it, your two it weeks? It would vary. I'd, uh, we, we went to Plains, Georgia. We went to uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, we went to uh, San Diego, California. Uh, I went twice out to Colorado Springs for uh, uh, career counselor training. I went to Camp Ripley a couple times. Um, went once out to uh, oh, let me give me time to think. Of <laughs> you've you've already <laughs> remembered a lot more than I would on that. So so no no boat time based on your A training. No um, no I was in a in construction so there was nothing ship duty about that. So you never had even the opportunity to be on a ship outside of a harbor no, or anything. No. Uh, did you have a did you have a want for that or did you like <laughs> Well, no I thanks? I thought well, yeah, it might might have been kind of interesting, but I really never went out my way for yeah, it. Yeah. There's but no I, day trips or no. anything <laughs> on that. How uh, about tours? Did you tour some of the the ships in San Diego? No, we did not. Really? No. Okay. No. no. I had a my son he was in the Navy for 23 years. And uh, he was stationed out on the East Coast, and and I happened to go out there for vacation at that time. And then he did give us a tour of of the boat that on a ship that he was on. You can't call mm -hmm. them call, can't call them boats, but yeah, yeah, I kind of <laughs> wondered about. It. I was like, ooh. <laughs> so, but that well, was, at least you got a tour on one and stuff, right? Yeah, you know, it, and it's crowded on a ship. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, but yeah, that was my only experience. Was your son able to like show you every part of the ship with like a private tour or, or uh, well, was it a pretty general? Yeah, it was kind of a general tour. Yeah. So, he was also on a, uh, I don't know, I guess I'd call it more of a cargo ship because he came in up by Maine and they had to, they kept the ship out about two miles. Sure. So so we went up there and he we went out there and he gave us more of a tour of that that ship than anything else. But mm -hmm. again, that wasn't really a, a navy ship. Right. So but 
But you get out on the water. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Boarding <laughs> yeah. a ship that's already two miles out. Right, yeah. Yeah. So you'd see these, they'd have cages in the water for trying to catch lobster and all of that. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did anything else uh, come to mind, you know, your your midway trip, the two uh, two bases in Vietnam, anything else coming to mind? What was like the, the things you enjoyed the most and disliked the most? Well, I had the opportunity on Midway. Uh, my commanding officer for my department was a pilot, and he had to maintain hours, you know, like all pilots do. So he took about three of us up in the plane. It was a sea airplane, I guess that's all I would call it. Sure. And I was able to get some nice videos of the island or pictures, and so that was one memorial memorial thing that I mm -hmm. did. And then... Uh, Let's see. Oh, and then I also went deep sea fishing. That's what I was trying to think of. Oh, yeah, yeah. we talked about yeah, that. Yeah, it was uh, all the scrap food that is accumulated over time or over a week or whatever it may be. It was put on this small boat. I'll call it like a something a little bit bigger than a tugboat. And we'd go out and we'd go beyond the reef and uh, we'd open the hatch and everything would just fall out into the sea and you know the fish would eat it and all and yeah it's just food particles right. not garbage yeah and so they had a couple of big heavy duty fishing poles stuck in the back okay so i'm going to man one of those fishing poles and uh i did snag into something and i tried reeling it in while well, i'd reel it in and zing it would take off again and it was about a 45 minute fight to get that in and it was i got a picture of it uh it was about as long as I am tall. Right. So I mean, it was it was quite an experience trying to reel that thing in. Mm hmm. And then you had a party with that, right? Yeah, there was an island party shortly after that, and fish was all cut up, and it was good. <laughs> so did somebody volunteer your fish, or or was this a planned party with what was caught that day, or what? No, I think it was just like an annual summer party. Sure. But it just happened to be. That I and caught like, that fish ahead of my time. fish. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, well, what I've done with yeah, it. Yeah, that's you know? just it. <laughs> so, you know. But it was all good experience and, you know, I enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. What was, uh, what was your least favorite part of your, say, your actor duty era? I can't really say I had a bad experience. Right. You know, so it was all, I was happy with everything I did, and mm -hmm. you know it was good. So yeah, never had a bad bad day, I guess I could say. Right, that's yeah. good. Yeah, mm -hmm. you just had to deal with mud and monsoons, right. and would your buildings and things actually get flooded when the monsoon season was there, or was it just muddy all around? No, it was just muddy. And this in uh, Quang Tree, we lived in a plywood building. You know, and there was like four people in one of these. Right. And of course, when it gets raining and everything, it just humid all over, you know, and when you, at night, when you crawl into bed, the sheets and everything are just damp. <laughs> so it was, I guess, okay, that'd be a bad experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not comfortable at all. No, no. So, okay. Uh, the notes that I have here, we've, we've, uh, we've covered all that part. It just, uh, it just sounds like you were, you had your duty, didn't second guess it, did what you needed to do, uh, supported the troops, the services, the CBs, went into the Naval Reserve for 16 years, and a friend of mine's dad was there too, and we were talking. Uh, I believe he was active duty the whole time. Do you remember having like active duty or full-time people at the Navy Reserves when you were there? Oh, yeah, all the... All the personnel that were doing books and all of that stuff, they were full-time active people. They were active duty people. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, Chuck must have been one of them because that's what, that's what brought the family here. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. And I'll, uh, uh, I'll see him a little bit later and, and uh, talk about that. And, okay. And, uh, but I, uh, I didn't know if you two had ever met. It doesn't sound like you no. had. So, uh -huh. but uh I mean, we may have seen each other, but, sure. I, but I never knew him. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, you got your 16 years 
done and was there was there like any fanfare or celebration for you or something or <laughs> or did you just walk out the door and, <laughs> that was basically it yeah <laughs> <laughs> well that, you know that's like uh, when people came back from vietnam you know there was nothing you know you just come back and you blend it in that, you were lucky if that happened yeah otherwise yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people been, had some terrible experiences right, with people. Right, yeah. But so then years later, then they started appreciating all that the Vietnam veterans did. And then they're, you know, mm -hmm. starting to, well, thank you for your service and all that. So that was good. Mm -hmm. And you're uh, you're part of the VFW post in, in Hudson? American Legion. Or American Legion yep. in Hudson. And then I've, I've joined the DAV in Sioux Falls, Disabled mm -hmm. American Veterans. And then I also joined, uh, they've got a Vietnam Veterans Post in Sioux Falls. So I've joined both of those. And I've got three military meetings that I go to a month. Mm -hmm. So You yeah. usually make each one? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I like getting, they give out a lot of information in Sioux Falls. So I like that so you know what's going on around the state or wherever. Right, and benefits and VA stuff, and right. do they teach you about a lot of that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. In the Air Guard, we have uh, retirees coffee once a oh, month sure. at the Alliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do any of the organizations that you're involved in, do they have any events or anything at the Alliance, or do you go to the Alliance very often? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, of course, the DAV, they meet south of town, right at, on the edge of town. Right. And then the... Vietnam Veterans Post, we meet in the Alliance, and then we meet the same day that the American Legion has their meeting. Oh. So we have our meeting at 5 o'clock, then we get out, of our, get out of our meeting, then we'll go over to their big room, and they have, they have a supper before their meeting. Mm. So we get our supper in and then nice. <laughs> sit there with the meeting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's cool. Yeah. Now, they purposely coordinate them so they're like that, or yeah. is it just... Yeah. Okay. So what are uh, what are some of the things that you guys do for fundraisers on on any of those three entities? Uh, for our post in Hudson, you know we have we have a turkey shoot once a year. We sell uh, raffle tickets. You know we'll sell so many and then pay out. We'll have weekly drawings and pay out the winners, and so that's that's a good money maker for us. Uh, and I guess the Legion in Sioux Falls and the VF, VF, Vietnam Veterans Post, uh, they do various various mm -hmm. fundraisers. Uh, yeah. You know. And uh, as, have you seen, uh, is it harder to get people to, be members of those have have memberships been declining or are they they holding pretty steady on the ones that you're in well the post in hudson is a fairly active post i mean we we've got like 80 members but there's probably only 12 people that show up at a meeting and that's a small town right yeah also. yeah but i mean they're from they could be from canton or right. inwood or rock valley wherever you know mm -hmm. but uh but we do good and uh you know it's it's a good post. We're holding tight with staying together. And then uh, these other posts, like the Vietnam Veterans Post in Sioux Falls, they've got about 80 members too, but the only people that show up are the the officers. Right. You know, and then I show up myself, but I'm not an officer, but right. I just go there because I like to get all that information. Right. And, of course, when the, when the American Legion, when we go over there, you know, that room is full, you know, so that's a big Legion group. Good. And they all show up. Yeah. So that's good to see that. Mm hmm So we've been going for uh, just under an hour. We've oh, talked okay. about a lot of stuff. <laughs> Have uh, you got any other thoughts that you'd like to say? Uh, well, here, I'll put it this way. As I said before on many of these, you know, we're, we're preserving a story, and uh, even if it's just for the family, some will put on YouTube – uh, most of them have so far, but if some want to keep it private, we'll just give them a digital copy of it. Um, but I usually ask, and I didn't prepare you for this question <laughs> at all, but, you know, your family's going to see this, you know, mm. hopefully. And say you have 
some great grandkids sitting over there or even three greats mm -hmm. grandkids over there. Uh, is there anything that you would like to say to them to pass on if some, they get to see great, 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 great grandpa? <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> no, no, no. But when you're gone and they're oh, come, yeah. all yeah. your family's yeah. going to keep moving, keep going. Well, it'll, it'll be um, good for them to see that. And, yeah. You know. Uh, Do you have any advice for them or anything, life advice or anything you would say if, if they were sitting there right in front of you, <laughs> if you had that opportunity? Just um, be yourself and do the best you can, uh, and don't try to be somebody you're not. You know that's about as basic as I could suggest for them. Yeah. Yeah. And and you figure that you figure that out about yourself as you grow. Right. Uh, I mm -hmm. can see. Uh, just to put a side note on it, you know, I've heard people say, "Oh, I wish I was 21 again or whatever," <laughs> and I was like. Never. I would never go back to anything less than 30. Right. Because yeah. 30 is actually a little little younger than 30 is when I reached my goal of buying this acreage, uh, getting horses at the time and all that. And I said, I would never go back to my 20s. I call them the tumultuous 20s. Oh. <laughs> but that's when you're figuring out the things that you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Through, those, so. through those struggles and trials mm -hmm. and figuring out what you're going to do with the rest of your life. Yeah. So... Uh, yeah, so you, you've had a pretty good run. You're not done yet. I'm glad to hear that you go into all three of those meetings. Yeah, and, yeah. Just and, stay uh, active in that, and you know they've they've got a lot of places they can you can volunteer for doing things in Sioux Falls, and you know even down here in Hudson. Mm -hmm. So, and people can also volunteer at the VA hospital. Right. Uh, right. Yep. I've got an aunt that did that for. 50, 55 years. Well, good for her. Uh, yeah, so that was, uh, you know, and, and she's long gone, but hopefully there's some other people that are taking her place. Oh, sure. Yep. Um, but volunteerism is is great, especially after we retire, we have a little more time. Right, yeah. For that, yep. that so, stuff. So. That's always good. That's good. Right, you bet. So. Well, Don, thank you for agreeing to do this, what, two days ago, three days ago, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, and uh, like I said, we're, we're getting to know each other a little better. We're... We're on the church board together, and uh, we just did some stuff uh, the other day, and that's when we when we planned this. So thank you very much for doing that. I have a lot of fun doing this, and I hope you did too. And oh yeah, I I want to thank you for this opportunity too. We've been I never knew you did this interviewing, and this is great. Yep. Well, thank you. Yeah, we're only like seven months into it. I didn't post any in February, so. Uh, yours will be the first of the next run okay. uh, of those. So hopefully I won't have another break again. But, you know, it was just the way it was through the winter. Sure. And you don't have to post every two weeks anyway. But thank right. you for doing this. You bet. Well, thank you. All right. Take care. I kept watching the time because I think we started when this timer was like six minutes in and then we started the real deal or whatever. So I think as a guest, we're probably pretty close to right at an hour. Oh, okay. That's pretty good. Pretty good. Hmm. Well, it'll be interesting to see how yeah. it all finishes up. Oh, how's your butt doing? Mine it's is getting sore. sore. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's probably why most of the time I'm like this, and I'm talking and I'm moving around. It's, this is the first time I've sat. Oh, okay. Sat yeah, that's a little bit of cushion there. But. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we'll pull this down.